You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. In Luke 17, 3, it says this, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day, and seven times a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. So that's the text that seems to convey that our forgiveness is conditional. And what is conditioned on? Expecting or having repentance. A demonstration of repentance. In this text, Luke is saying, rebuke him when there's an offense. And then if he repents, then we forgive him. So before we examine this a little more closely, let's open in prayer because this is a very controversial subject and I think we'll just not discuss it today. Now I want to hit it head on. So we're going to look at it from a biblical standpoint and try to examine it carefully. Father, we just come to you this morning recognizing how needful we are of your grace each day. And as we look at these principles and precepts from your word, we ask, Father, that you would guide and direct us in all things of understanding, that we may rightly divide your word, that we may apply your word in our daily lives. We thank you for your spirit that gives us illumination and empowerment to do so. And we thank you, Lord, for your divine revelation that you've given us. We just pray that you'd guide us now. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as we think of communication, we have to recognize in every relationship there are communication breakdowns and there are conflicts. So conflicts, they happen in church, they happen in marriage, they happen in every realm, in every relationship in life. So there will be times when we'll encounter conflicts or disputes or even sin. And so we have to ask, how do we deal with that? When we talk about forgiveness, this bears the question, is it uh, do we forgive unconditionally or is it based on a condition? That was the question I posed last week towards the end of the class. Now, We can consider what unconditional forgiveness looks like from a biblical perspective. And I'm going to cite an Old Testament example of that as well as a New Testament example. And Scripture gives us principles for dealing with offenses. So are there times when we just have unilateral, unconditional Forgiveness, that is my question. Unilateral being one-sided. In other words, can I forgive somebody when there's no demonstration from the offender that there's any repentance? Is that possible? And are we called to do so? Did I hear? Yes. Okay. Are there times in circumstances that require our confrontation when there is a known sin that's unrepentant? Yes. So we have both sides of this avenue of dealing with offenses, and so we have to consider both of them and how they apply to our lives. If we don't understand this, we could go about having the mindset and I'm going to give you a very prominent author that promotes this in the evangelical realm, 
which many know and, and have studied under. But the concept from one point of view is that we never render complete forgiveness until we see repentance. Now think of the ultimate consequence of that kind of philosophy. That would mean any offense on any level would never be forgiven until somebody that had been the offender responds in a repentant manner and shows that. Dorothy. Okay, great uh, illustration there. Dorothy said that when someone doesn't render forgiveness, and that is from the heart, it eats away at you. And scripture bears, bears that out, Matthew 18. So let's consider here uh, some of the biblical precepts that command us that are what is known as biblical imperatives and examine that in light of some offenses. How about this? Keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. That's 1 Peter 4.8. Thomas. Is one another a Christian to a Christian? Yes. All right, so we don't have to forgive that. No, you can just hate them. Because <laughs> I was concerned about that. <laughs> Okay, the question is, is the context here in 1 Peter, uh, forgiving one another? It expands. It's almost the same question that the Jews asked Christ when he was talking about forgiveness and talking about ministering, forgiving their neighbor. Hand went up. One of the Well, let's say he's not a Pharisee or Sadducee. Let's just say one of the disciples says, well, who's our neighbor? And Christ then gives the example of the good Samaritan. So what he was trying to communicate is that our forgiveness is from the heart. It isn't conditioned upon who the individual is, maybe a Christian. And in some contexts, it speaks of Christians. It may be anyone. Let's consider um, another text. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. That's from Proverbs 10:12. He who covers a transgression seeks love. Proverbs 17:9. Now, what is the definition of love? We're talking about agape love, and one of the elements of agape love is it does not take into an account a wrong suffered. In other words, we don't keep lists. If somebody offends us, we don't go down through this litany of lists of things that they've done and just start adding those up. It's an accounting. We don't take into an account a wrong suffered. Many times we'll come across individuals in our lives that have suffered greatly and There has never been a biblical resolve. In those cases, there needs to be an attempt, at least, to bring about biblical resolve, because there's a need for that. In other times, there's just blatant unforgiveness, regardless of the level of the offense. And that's what we want to address here. We're going to look today at some of the conditions, if you would, and the, what, what biblical forgiveness looks like, how that is lived out, and some biblical examples of unforgiveness that is unconditional. Next week, we want to look at biblical examples and biblical imperatives that call upon us to confront somebody in sin. So there's two aspects of this element of forgiveness. We have to examine both sides of it carefully, but from a biblical viewpoint. When I say forgiveness, let me ask you this question. Is forgiveness 
simply boil down to a feeling. In other words, I really don't feel like forgiving somebody. Or what about this? I really don't feel love for that individual anymore. Is love a feeling? Biblical love. Let's start with that. Okay. What did you say, Dorothy? I didn't hear. Okay. We're commanded, and scriptures replete with commands for believers to love. And that love is an agape, agapao in the original language. That love is all the elements and principles that are given to us in 1 Corinthians 13. The very text that many times marriages, they read uh, during the ceremony of marriage, ceremony. But that's the elements of love. So love is a choice. Yes, there will be emotion attached with love. And as we render love, we're doing so as an act of obedience. We're commanded to do so. So it isn't just a legal act. We are doing so out of our own volition. We are desiring to exercise that love, and we are making that choice to do so. And it's also in obedience to what God's commanded us to do. So love or forgiveness either is not just uh, feeling, but it is a choice. It gets a little bit interesting because we don't have anything in us that's good enough to love somebody in that way without the Holy Spirit doing that. Good. Okay, that's a great element to bring into this. Can, let's ask, an unbeliever or a believer who is in sin exhibit godly love? Okay. What about a believer who's in sin? He can understand it, but can he really love somebody when he is in the midst or throes of sin? Katie? That's correct. If a person is in sin and we're not in communion with God, we don't have the capacity to allow the Spirit to empower us to love. So we, if we're in the flesh, we cannot exhibit agape love. There's just no way. It's not a fleshly, it's not something we can do of our own volition even. <clears throat> it's a work of God's spirit, and it's a work in which we do as we're in right relationship with God. It's an evidence. It's a fruit of the spirit. In fact, the very first element of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, and so on. Okay, so we want to consider one example from the Old Testament. I'm going to use the example of Joseph. Now, Joseph, when he was young, he received a a cloak of many colors from his father as a sign of favor. He also had a dream. And so being a young, zealous young boy, he went about and told his brothers, and his brothers started becoming jealous. Jealous to the point where they took Joseph and they threw him in a pit. They dug a pit and threw him in it. They really wanted to kill him. But one of the younger brothers appealed for his life, and they said, well, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. So they sold him into slavery. He was sold into slavery into Egypt. And then Joseph was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife that he was accused of making a a play for her and she 
brought the accusation to her husband. He was falsely accused and then imprisoned wrongfully. There's no evidence that Joseph ever showed any grudge or any bitterness for all his circumstances. Gradually, God showed favor through Joseph, even in jail, and then raised him to the place of prominence, even to the second in command under the Pharaoh. So Joseph was God's vessel to accomplish some extremely uh, historical things in the Old Testament. But what had happened is there was a great famine. And we all know the story that Joseph, under the leadership of the Pharaoh, but giving the Pharaoh his dream, had told him there's going to be three years of prosperity and then there's going to be famine. So the Pharaoh arranged for him to accumulate food, and he did so. And there was a great famine in the land. And Jacob sends his sons, not all of them, but sends all of them but one, to appeal to the Pharaoh for food. So they come to the Pharaoh, and lo and behold, who meets them? Their brother Joseph. They didn't recognize Joseph. They didn't even know if he was alive. And we don't know exactly how many years later this was, but it was a sufficient time later. Here's Joseph in a place of prominence at the, under the throne of the Pharaoh, and the brothers come in. Joseph reveals himself to the brothers, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold in Egypt. And now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me here before you to preserve life. Now, I have to ask this question. From the text, there was never any any evidence of repentance or asking of forgiveness from those brothers to Joseph. None. So we ask the question, was that forgiveness that Joseph rendered out of his heart conditional? Was there any formal transaction there? Did the brothers, is it revealed in scripture here that the brothers ask forgiveness? No. That's in Genesis 45, verses 4 and 5. None at all. There was no evidence, nothing given to us in scripture that says that the, as soon as the brothers recognized Joseph, they prostrated themselves, asked forgiveness, and demonstrated repentance. Nothing like that. Joseph rendered unconditional forgiveness and showed that love to his brothers. Dorothy. Well, I think the reason he did is because he understood the providence of God and he understood that his mission was for God. Uh, he hadn't gone through that and he knew he was doing what God had wanted him to do. Exactly. What Dorothy is saying here is that Joseph had such a relationship with God that he understood God's providence in this. Somehow, God had placed him in this circumstance and then raised him to this level of prominence to be used of God to do great provision for the tribe of Israel. So what happens later? The closest that we ever see of showing any kind of of formal evidence of their sorrow for their sin was this. Once their father had died, they imagined that their offended brother Joseph was going to just probably unleash all his vengeance against them. So they made up this story. Because of their fear of what Joseph might do in retaliation for all that they have done, they come back to him and they concocted a story saying that their dad, Joseph, or their dad, father, Jacob, wanted them to be forgiven by Joseph. So they conveyed that to Joseph. And 
his response was this, and this is in Genesis 50. This is five chapters later. You meant this for evil against me, but God meant it for good. The knowledge of what God was going to do through his sufferings made it possible for Joseph not to harbor a grudge. He was able to forgive them unconditionally, even though they had at that time concocted a story to protect themselves, thinking, now that our father Jacob is dead, he's, he's going to do us in. We're done. So what are we going to do here? So they're always plotting and deceiving. But there's no evidence of repentance. Yeah, fear. And they were brought low by their sin. And they were humbled by the fact that their brother forgave them unconditionally. So there may be individuals in our lives who have caused us sorrow, pain. So what does that look like in our life? Uh, I can think of evidences and Thomas made a good point here, and we have to consider this. What about friends or family that are unsaved and have offended us or done things to hurt us or pained us? Are they capable of repentance apart from God's regeneration? Are they actually capable of doing anything that would really render true repentance? An unregenerate? I have a picture of this. Maybe that could happen. I'm thinking about there that without the Holy Spirit, we're not able to do that. I would think that some unregenerate, unsaved people could truly, truly be sorry and repent for what they've done. You can know if you think they're sorry to that heart. Yeah. There's a difference, and that's a good point, Dave. There is genuine, uh, sometimes, Regret and remorse when a person does some great offense as an unbeliever. And they can express remorse and they can say they're sorry and make apology, which the apology in the original language is apologia. That's making an excuse. That's what apology is. Repentance, on the other hand, we're going to look at a little bit later. What I'm trying to say here is there is no genuine repentance apart from God granting that. And let me tell you what I support that with. 2 Timothy 2, if you wouldn't mind turning there with me. I know we're going to go to a few different texts today. But 2 Timothy 2. Now here, Paul is giving instruction to Timothy as a young pastor, and he's guiding him on how to deal with certain situations. And he instructs Timothy from 2 Timothy 2, beginning with verse 22, to flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who, what? Call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. But then he gives this admonition. Verse 23, but foolish and ignorant disputes <clears throat> avoid, knowing that they do generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle unto all, able to teach, patient. And one of the other translations says patient when wrong. In humility, listen to this, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them what? Who grants it? God. It is a work of God, but here in this context, he's using God's vessel to minister in love to that individual that has been in a snare. Perhaps it will grant repentance to him that they may know the truth and listen to this, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Dorothy. Yes, there is. And we're going to look at that text. It's actually 1 Corinthians 5. 
Paul was dealing with there with somebody within the church who was having a relationship with his father's wife, which would have been his stepmother, which would have been considered in that culture heinous. It would have been considered incest. And Paul is addressing them and rebuking the church because of their arrogance. Because, why? They never addressed the sin. Then he goes, and I didn't say for you to address the idolater and adulterer and all those, he lists a litany of sin for those outside the church, but do you not judge those who are in the church? So he's talking about that separation. We don't judge anyone that's not a believer. That's God's to do. But within the body of Christ, we were called to do so. So we're going to look at that text at a later point when we, as we address the aspect of confrontation. So we looked at that in, uh, individual and we think about, I can think of, and I didn't do it well, so I'm not going to use myself as some shining example here, but as we took care of my parents and my stepdad, when my mom had cancer and my stepdad had numerous strokes, and they were pretty well debilitated, wheelchair. Um, neither of them were saved. So there were times when they said things and did things that I actually hated. I mean, I literally hated it because it was sinful. They reviled the people in the church. People in the church would come over and, you know, try to minister to them or bring a meal or something, and they'd just mock them. Well, I would correct that, but there was never any, even a sign of remorse, let alone anything close to repentance. And yet, recognizing that they were unregenerate, I hated what they did, but I was able to forgive them by God's grace. I didn't do it well sometimes. I really struggled. I really did. So I fully acknowledge that. And there were some times that I just totally had to repent of my attitudes. But what I'm trying to say here, what it looks like when we're talking about some situations, and we're going to look at that a little bit closer here, there are some situations in which we render unconditional forgiveness. So we have to understand that God's called us to do that. And he's got a higher purpose. When we consider this attitude that Paul's conveying to Timothy here, his purpose there is that we're not to be arguers for the truth. We're not to, we're to avoid arguments, but we're not to quarrel. Our attitude should be one of being able to have somebody even say things that are offensive to us and be able to minister to them gently and with patience. That requires the ability to submit ourselves to God's Spirit. We cannot do that possibly at all without that grace. Most of those who hold that uh, forgiveness is conditional consider that forgiveness as being a formal transaction in which the forgiven one repents and the offended party then promises never to uh, bring up the situation or sin again. If this doesn't occur, then forgiveness doesn't take place. With that view of forgiveness, there must always be a formal process in which the offended party has to acknowledge formally their sin and express repentance. And then... The offended party has to determine whether that's really genuine. So, in that that situation, if it's more of an appointment, I can see that in a church body where you're going to be around people, if there's somebody that you can find that's more, and and the uh, bringing it up is going to cause more trouble than it's going to be. Is it better just to forgive them and That's the question that we're going to address. Okay. 
I want to say this very respectfully. Uh, there's teachers within Christendom that have brought forth uh, teachings that that's the only kind of forgiveness there is, is when somebody repents. And I'm going to discuss those teachers, and uh, they'll be well known to many of you. Many of us have had their teaching. Uh, I once counseled a, a man. He was about 50. And by the way, when I use counseling illustrations, it's never going to be anyone that is related to this church or part of this church. This man had been taught that only time you forgive is if the person repents. And there's a formal transaction. He had been taught that by his pastor. He had read a book to confirm that teaching. And it gave, actually gave Luke 17 as one of the foundational part of that teaching. As a consequence, he had not forgiven his wife. He had not forgiven his employer. He had not forgiven fellow employees. He was angered and unforgiving of his child. He had a child. He had a ought against his pastor. His pastor, he said, did ask forgiveness, but he didn't think it was genuine. So he was riddled with bitterness. The man was very ill. And uh, I spent several months with him, actually about six months, before he moved. And then he moved away. But... Um, During the course of that time, the first thing I tried to do was to determine whether he was truly a believer. He insisted that he was. And during the course of our counseling, I finally asked him a question. Can you give me some kind of evidence here? I mean, I'm having a hard time figuring out. You're telling me you're a Christian. And yet you've given me a list of people I don't know, but of family members, church members, employer, employees, relatives, cousins, uncles, mother, father, that you hate. I don't hate them. And I'll forgive them. Well, okay. But you're still filled with unforgiveness. Well, yeah. I'm not. I, my forgiveness is like God's forgiveness. And when we repent, God forgives us. Okay? So there's no place for you to forgive until you deem these people truly repentant. He said, that's right. So it took me several months to bring forth some of the things that I just did here in 30 minutes, but it took me months of meeting with this man to finally bring the Lord brought him to a place of understanding that he was taught wrongly. There are sometimes, yes, when we have to confront, and it is necessary to do in a biblical way, and yet we do so in love. But he didn't understand the essence of forgiveness was from the heart. He looked at it as a formal legal transaction. That's how he addressed it. And when they did this, and when they went through the proper steps, and when he deemed them truly repentant, then he would render that forgiveness. He was sick, physically and emotionally. And he just bore so much hatred inside that everything and everybody was being defiled. There wasn't one individual in his life that wasn't being defiled. The very thing that the author of Hebrews commands and admonishes us to avoid. He thought he was a Christian in obeying God. He was miserable. He had lost his family, lost his job, and alienated himself from every relationship that he ever had. Every relationship. At that time, I was the only one even talking to him. And it was hard for me. I admit it. <laughs> well, our forgiveness is not 
It's not based on whether a person is a believer or an unbeliever. No. I mean, you forgive, you should forgive anybody in whatever walk of life they are. Right? There it is, right there. What Dave just said is the essence of what we're looking at here. Our forgiveness is not conditional upon who that individual is. This particular individual, really, I never saw any evidence of salvation. Toward the end, uh, there was more of a, a repentance shown. But during that whole course, several, many months, there was no evidence. I had to go to the Lord because of his hardness of heart and his stubbornness. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And a backslider in heart will have this fill of his own ways. So he was convinced he'd separated himself. There's all kinds of proverbs that talk about that. He becomes stiff-necked, you name it, all of those things. He would argue with me. Uh, I would try to apply 2 Timothy 2, not to be argumentative. I had a difficult time with this man. I really cared about him, but I disdained his heretical views of what forgiveness was. And I I just ached for those in his life and for him because of the misery that he was experiencing because of his unforgiveness. So as we consider this, yes, there are times when we need to forgive just unconditionally. So we have to realize that there are times when we can look at the opposite. Uh, When Stephen, in Acts 6 and 7, we look at Stephen as the first martyr in the church. When he was falling down to his knees and crying out to the Lord, They had stoned him. For what reason? Because he stood up for Jesus Christ. He stood up against the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all the religious leaders, and he brought forth truth. They hated that. So they stoned him. Paul, perhaps, was holding the coat of those who were stoning him. As he was falling down in his pain, in his agony, and dying, from the afflictions and the wounds from the rocks that they cast at him, he said this from Acts 7.60. Falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And having said this, he fell asleep. Was there any evidence of repentance on any of those religious leaders? They were still stoning him. And I can't even imagine. I mean, I get, if a rock kicks up when I'm snow blowing, I have to go in the house and rest for a while. These people were throwing stones to afflict wounds, fatal wounds upon him. And he looked up to the Lord and called out and pleaded for them. Now, we have... Another example from the Old Testament in which it was just the antithesis of that. Now here I'm going to show you the the evidence of how there's so many times when we have dichotomies in Scripture that seem to be almost opposites. I'm going to cite the case of 2 Chronicles. You don't have to turn there. 2 Chronicles 24 verses 21 and 22. This is uh, an account of Zechariah. He was being stoned to death. They were going to kill him. And we have all the evidences of the prophets of the Old Testament in chapter 11. Some of them were sawed and asunder, sawed in two. Some of them were stoned to death. But they suffered greatly for the Lord. Here, Zechariah, the account. So they conspired against him, and at the command of the king, they stoned him to death in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus, Joas, the 
Joash, the king did not remember the kindness that his father Jehoiada, Jehoiada had shown him. But he murdered his son. And as he was dying, he uttered these words. <clears throat> May the Lord see and avenge me. Yeah. Quite a contrast to Stephen. But was it wrong for him to say that? Right. There is a time of righteous uh, anger in calling upon the Lord to carry that out. Calling on the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So it is God's job to carry out that vengeance. So Zechariah knew that. David knew that in the imprecatory Psalms. And as we look throughout Scripture, there's many times where saints have called out for God's vengeance. Thomas. There's, a, there's an area here I'm struggling because what you're talking about in Joseph's case is uh, men who had visions from God. And the other individuals you are talking about are men who die in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. How do you address someone who approaches you and said, my father raped me for 10 years straight. Or my brother beat the snot out of me every day during my childhood. How do you? How does a person like that? What does forgiveness look like to a person like that? Okay, excellent question. Thomas is saying there are times where brutal, violent crimes have been carried out against somebody. How do we deal with that? Do you say, well, just forgive from your heart, even if the Lord doesn't grant them repentance. No, there is great justification in carrying out to the fullest extent any uh, laws that would be governing that offense to be able to take that person, if they can, to the extent of the law and prosecute and may, make sure that they're carried out to... Um, there still needs to be forgiveness. So... We're going to deal with that, and I, I don't want to get sidetracked here because I'm dealing with unconditional forgiveness. Next week, we're going to deal with with those type of situations. Bar. I was just going to say that in that case, there's a difference between forgiveness and restoration. You would never be required to have to have forgiveness to do with uh, a person in a position where they're going to record crimes against you. Exactly. Yeah. There's... Uh, there was another question that related similar to what Barbara just said. Barb just said that you would never be required to uh, be with an individual that had carried out and would try to continue to carry out that type of a heinous sin against another individual or crime. So we're not talking about resolving or, or reconciliation of that. We're talking about forgiveness. So we're going to look at that in that context when we're talking about confrontation and sins of that degree next week. But this week, we're dealing with what you might consider, uh, well, we couldn't consider Joseph's brothers as a small thing. I mean, they really tried to kill him, and they really didn't care. And they were jealous. They exhibited all kinds of sin. So we're just looking at areas of which we can exercise forgiveness. Katie. Okay. My definition of forgiveness in my mind is when somebody offends you and you want to wring their neck, and forgiving them is making them feel like they're not wanting to wring their neck anymore, or it's not, not to not hold it against them. It means you're not going to take them to court, but it's, I mean, it's something different than that. It's like your desire to, to inflict harm on that person. And if that is the definition of forgiveness, I'm not sure I, I can understand any situation where you would, where, where forgiveness would be conditional. So, what's your definition of forgiveness? <laughs> okay. I'm going to give that today, hopefully, if I get to it. I've got a very specific definition of what forgiveness is and what it looks like. 
Okay, but let's let's go on here. So how can we make the distinction when God says forgive one another just as God in Christ Jesus also has forgiven you? When we consider that, many have taken that. That's from Ephesians 4, verse 32, and Colossians 3.13. They're saying the same things. We're to forgive others as just as Christ has forgiven us. So many have taken that, those texts right there, and formed the doctrine that, okay, God forgives you when you what? Repent. That's required for justification. person says, I came to the Lord, I prayed a prayer, and now I'm saved. You ask them if they repented, and they go, what? If they say that, then they're not saved. We cannot be saved apart from acknowledgement of our sin and turning to God from our sin. Even that is a gift of God. So we have to understand there's a distinction between a holy, righteous God granting justification and us Forgiving from the heart. We're not, when somebody forgives, I'm going to get more specific with that, but I've already mentioned that there's those that take position of this conditional forgiveness. One man that does so is Jay Adams. Now, Jay Adams is uh, one of the founders of a method of counseling, neuthetic counseling, which I have studied and used the principles and precepts, but his uh, whole premise on forgiveness is this. I'm going to quote from his book, which comes from From Forgiving to Forgiving. This is from page 34. It should go without saying that since our forgiveness is modeled after God's in Ephesians 4.32, it must be conditional. Forgiveness by God rests upon clear, unmistakable conditions. The apostles did not merely announce that God had forgiven men. Paul and the apostles turned away from those who refused to meet the conditions, just as John and Jesus did earlier when the scribes and Pharisees would not repent. End of quote. So his belief is that there is never any unconditional forgiveness. On any level. You mentioned overlooking. You can overlook, but that doesn't forgive the individual until they show forgiveness or repentance. I'm sorry. That's his philosophy. Now, I think there's a difference between forgiving people for their sins on an eternity based situation than forgiving them for running into the car or not paying. Well, that's what we want to make a distinction. And this is where I uh, have a departure from Jay Adams. I respect the man deeply, and I hold to many of his precepts. He's very biblical in his counseling. But on this aspect of his rendering of forgiveness, I, I hold a different view. There are times, which we'll look at next week, where, where uh, an offense has to be confronted. We must, and we're commanded to. It's an imperative from Scripture. But there are other times when we forgive unilaterally. That is, it doesn't require anything from the other person. When Scripture instructs us to forgive in the manner we've forgiven, what's being conveyed to the believer? It doesn't appear to be withholding forgiveness uh, until the offender expresses it. While it's true, at times forgiveness involves a two-way transaction. We're going to look at that. It's not true of all forgiveness. There are times when we are to show unilateral, unconditional forgiveness. There are times that we follow biblical principles to exercise that forgiveness. There are examples of forgiveness that is conditional in Scripture and their example of unconditional. I looked at some of those this morning. Those are just a couple. But Scripture is replete with both. 
with both sides, both the side that requires repentance for us to exercise that forgiveness. But we have to remember that forgiveness uh, is something in which comes from our heart. It can be what we look at as a formal transaction, but if it becomes a legal transaction, then we really haven't understood the aspect of forgiveness. So I'm going to try to give you a brief understanding of of what forgiveness looks like. Um, there's a scripture in Matthew, you don't have to turn there, 11, 25, and 26. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you. This describes immediate forgiveness. And it doesn't require a formal seeking of one's repentance. That command, that imperative, has no condition to it. None. The one in Luke 17 does. So here, let's take a look at what what is forgiveness. In essence, when a person chooses to forgive, that they purpose and they resolve not to remember the offense. They refuse to hold a grudge. They give up any claim to recompense. Forgiveness resists the temptation to brood or to try to retaliate. When we think of forgiveness, the offended party simply bears the insult or the offense. We give it over to the Lord. This would apply to unintentional offenses, petty offenses, and sometimes offenses that deeply hurt us. So that's what it would look like. We have, I'll get to yours, we have a difficulty. Sometimes offenses just come right back to us. Even though we've chosen to forgive the individual and we purposed never to bring it up and we purposed to forgive them from our heart, as God gives us grace. But when we encounter that individual, we may have the struggle with our emotions, with our flesh, to not want to carry out some retribution. But the key here is the heart. Are we willing to continually forgive that individual? Thomas. Uh, In the beginning of your definition of, of forgiveness, the first part was Forgetting. Is that correct? No. Oh, Choosing okay. to forget and forget. No, forget. Choosing yeah. to forget. Choosing not to remember. When God says, your sins I will remember no more, you're talking about an omniscient God. You think God forgets it? No. What he's saying in the original there in that Hebrew context is talking about he chooses not to bring into remembrance that offense. And that's what I'm saying. We're choosing not to remember. We can dwell on things and just bring that whole flood right back in, all the hurt, all the anguish, and then what? We we carry it out. We have an offense in our heart. So we're choosing not to remember. We don't forget. Okay. Though, the picture I see of that coming back at you. Yeah. Is a Vietnam vet when he's through with the war and everything mm-hmm. else, you know, he has nightmares. Yeah. Delayed stress. Yeah, you have, you have, there's the reality to that. Many, uh, my fellow, uh, Marines have suffered with that after Vietnam and to the point where they can't sleep. They woke up and tried to attack their spouse not knowing where they were. So there's a lot of things that happen 
And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the volitional aspect. And we can be so traumatized in life that we will have these dreams. And that's only by God's grace that we can have our minds renewed. And that isn't something that just happens like that. So we have to recognize there's a starting point. The starting point is here, from the heart. The process could be a long and difficult process. We have to rely on God's grace for that. Does that give you somewhat of an idea of what forgiveness looks like? Okay, we're going to talk about that next week. (laughs) We actually never seek vengeance. But we do carry out a process in which we confront a sin in some cases. And we're commanded to do so. No, no, we still have to confront and uh, we'll have to make some clarification there because we can forgive, but we might not receive somebody in fellowship. So we, there are going to be some parameters in those relationships. It's not going to be, oh, let's go have lunch together. No, we're prohibited from even doing so with some circumstances. So we're going to look at that next week. These are very difficult things. If we don't understand them, we can really do harm in the body. If we don't understand biblical confrontation, we can do permanent damage to somebody. We have to understand the whole essence is love and bringing the individual to repentance. I think the vengeance is pretty much a premeditated thing that occurred after the fact of some crime or heinous crime. Yeah. And Jim, Jim's um, article. article for this month brought up, you know, harm being done to your wife or family or the rapist or murderers coming into your home. Yeah. And that, if you take care of him, it's not vengeance. No. No, I was waiting for somebody to mention that article. I don't know how many of you I mean, read that. I got a 44 Magnum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're talking here not about a crime of violence against somebody, although that could happen. We're talk- And we still have to recognize there's some parameters within that even. We're not talking about defending a life here. We're talking about specifically offenses that occur in relationships. Well, not a violent crime that's happening. Later on. You don't want to do that. We'll discuss that next week. <laughs> we're run out of time. Okay, let's close. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.